Thank you. Uh, this is Jerry Barrett talking. Today's date is uh, March 6, 1986. Um, I'm interviewing Bill Ustry in his office in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, about uh, the um, labor relations at uh, Eastern Airlines. Um, Bill, what, why don't you start with uh, by talking about where you first got involved with, uh, with Eastern? Uh, it was an early summer of uh, 1983, and we would have to search out the date. I got a call from uh, Bill Wimpensinger, uh, international president of the International Association of Machinists, and he said that he had been talking to Frank Borman, chief executive officer of Eastern Airlines, and that they both concluded that they had to do something to improve their labor relations uh, at Eastern Airlines, and that in his course of conversation to Borman, he suggested that Borman might like to talk to me about assisting Eastern in this endeavor. Uh, shortly thereafter, I got a call from, uh, from Colonel Borman, and uh, he uh, gave me the date that he was going to be in Washington and that uh, he would like to sit down and talk with me. Uh, we did agree to a date, and I met with uh, Colonel Borman at the uh, Jefferson Hotel, uh, a couple of three blocks from the office, and he and I spent several hours together, approximately two hours and a half, talking about Easton, and uh, we shook hands, and I told him that I would uh, be glad to, uh, I would look forward to joining with him, and, uh, or assisting him in whatever role I could to try to uh, see if we could bring about a better understanding between labor and management, especially the, uh, the IAM and the Eastern management. Uh, he had gone over in quite some detail to the negotiations that had occurred earlier that year in the spring of 83 between the IAM and the uh, Eastern Airlines, which had become quite bitter uh, and namely between the two personalities, the two principal personalities, which was Colonel Borman and uh, Charlie Bryant, uh, president of District 100 of the International Association of Machinists at Eastern Airlines. So we went in great detail to talk about to, uh, what all happened. I had had some uh, conversations earlier and I, uh, with uh, Bob Harris, the chairman of the National Mediation Board, uh, about uh, the negotiations, and I had pretty well kept abreast of the negotiations that had gone on that spring, even though I was not directly involved. It was uh, ver very disturbing as to the, the seemingly the way that negotiations had uh, gone on and the way it had been handled. But having no first-hand knowledge, I listened to Colonel Borman from his point of view, and I uh, told him that, uh, I would be back with him in a few days to give him a firm answer about when I could come down to Miami and uh, meet with him and other officials of the company and in turn meet with the union officials. He was uh, very desirous of me uh, doing it as soon as I could and primarily to meet with, uh, with uh, Charlie Bryant that, uh, that uh, they may uh, forget the, uh, as much as they could about the, uh, the difficulties they had early in the spring. He had also advised me that uh, they had the uh, uh, upcoming uh, in another couple of months the, uh, the flight attendance negotiations, which uh, flight attendants are affiliated with the Transport Workers Union, and that their negotiations uh, was about to get into a 30-day cooling off period uh, uh, imposed by the uh, Railway Labor Act or the National Mediation Board. They were in mediation at that time, and that. Uh, a mediator by the name of Harry Bickford was handling their mediation. Uh, he was quite con concerned of the outcome of those negotiations, and at the time I had been uh, was quite too uh, busy with other clients. And several weeks went by, uh, or, or a couple of three weeks, uh, before I had got back to Colonel Bowman, and he got back to me. He was very anxious for me to uh, to get down to Miami. Uh, along in, uh, I would think it was in June or July, I went down to Miami for a couple of days and met with Colonel Borman and in turn met with uh, Charlie Bryant. Uh, and uh, then uh, I arranged a meeting between uh, uh, Colonel Borman and Charlie Bryant, mostly to just talk to them together <coughs> to see if we could reach uh, 
better understandings between them and that we could proceed to uh, to develop and improve a relationship. Uh, as I was saying, I was quite busy, so it was uh, several weeks before I got back down there and Colonel Borman had called numerous times by this time they're needing help and assistance in the, in the upcoming flight attendance negotiations. And the, uh, the, uh, the uh, cost of operating the airline was, uh, was uh, rising at such a rapid pace and the loss of business uh, brought on in large part by the uh, conflicts early in the year and now the conflict with the, and the threat of a strike and so forth with the flight attendants was playing havoc with the, uh, with the uh, revenue. And so uh, uh, as soon as I could uh, uh, get a few days together, I just told him I would be down there. He was very insistent. I went down uh, uh, in the uh, early part of August and uh, the 30-day cooling off period was running out on August the 15th. And after listening to, uh, to uh, uh, both sides a little bit in the flight attendance negotiations and talking with the mediator, uh, I was, uh, it was obvious that uh, there was a very serious uh, conflict about to, uh, uh, to begin. Uh, as a result of the negotiations with the mechanics earlier that year, uh, the, it had had an additional cost and the loss of revenue doing the threats that they had. And prior to those negotiations, the Colonel Borman had gotten the uh, pilots to uh, agree to make certain commitments of concessions to the company. And uh, by this time, it is perceived by the pilots that those concessions they had made that Colonel Borman had taken the concessions and given them to the, uh, to the International Association of Machinists. Mm. Uh, Colonel Borman apparently had uh, told the pilots earlier that that he was going to stand up to the International Association of Machinists and, and if they would assist him he was even going to take a strike and fly through the strike. He had even gotten the pilots uh, interested in uh, uh, supposedly in not only doing pilots work but assisting in other work so that they could be successful. Uh, and, and if a strike occurred and uh, the pilots were, were prepared apparently f to assist him in that in, in such an endeavor. When it when the end of the cooling off period was coming and Colonel Borman was threatened with a strike with the uh, with the mechanics or the IEM, uh, he only could find that he had 11 days of operating cash uh, and he uh, recognized immediately that if if the IM called his bluff that uh, he would either have to take a strike or have to give in to uh, to what the IM wanted and that 11 days was not going to give him enough time to be successful in any strike and uh, he would uh, probably then find himself in bankruptcy into chapter 11. Uh, he told me that he had been to uh, New York to the various uh, banks and financial institutions to try to write, raise enough cash that he could, do, uh, could uh, have enough to, f to operate doing a strike, uh, but he was not able to get the banks to go along with him because in this time the banks had pretty well cut off of, uh, uh, the um, money that they was letting him borrow. The carrier had lost a huge sums of money uh, the year before, and therefore he had no uh, revolving account of which to which to draw upon. So as a result, in the final analysis, he had to cave in to the, uh, what he says, to the mechanics to give them what they wanted to prevent a strike. And of course, by doing this, he had uh, not only made the pilots mad at him, uh, because of giving what they perceived to be their money uh, to Charlie Bryant uh, and, and, and that settlement. And therefore now the flight attendants and their bargaining looked back and said, well, if Mr. Bryant could get his money, uh, then they wanted their money also. And of course this really created a, a, a dilemma when I, when I arrived there and I found out what was going on. Uh, 
the flight attendants was the third uh, major organization to bargain in that round of bargaining. So uh, uh, the first uh, the week that I was down there, I went over to uh, the Diplomat Hotel where the AFL-CIO was holding some meetings and labor meetings was going over, going on. And I ran into a, a newspaper guy that I knew when I was uh, registering at the uh, desk, and he had, had heard the news that I was going to assist Eastern Airlines, and, and uh, he wanted to know, did I accept uh, the theory that the financial difficulties that the company was as the company had said, or did I accept where the unions were saying it was that it wasn't that bad? Uh, I don't know to this day why I thought of such. I said I do not agree with the company and I do not agree with uh, the unions because I do not know. He asked me the next question as to how you're going to, well, how are you going to find out for yourself? And I said, well, I'm not that shrewd in, uh, in high finance at Eastern Airlines. I would uh, get some professional people to, uh, to assist me in ascertaining whether the company had a serious financial problem or they're not. Uh, that uh, and the next day that was printed in the newspaper, which uh, uh, did not necessarily make uh, Borman delighted that I had not agreed with him about the finance, but had certainly made the unions uh, uh, delighted that I had not sided with the company immediately upon coming down there to say that there was a serious financial problem. Uh, that point of view, uh, as I will denote later, uh, led to uh, uh, the, <coughs> the appointment a designation of the Lazar Foray uh, accounting firm or investment bankers in New York to come in and do a quick analysis of the company's books, uh, which led to the Lazar Foray people being involved in, uh, as in, the, in the future. Uh, but in the meantime, we was pursuing the flight attendance negotiations it came close to, getting close to August the 15th. Uh, Mr. Bright and uh, uh, president of District 100 the IEM and Mr. George Smith, who at that time was chairman of the, of the um, uh, pilots organization, the chairman of the MEC, their master executive committee. Uh, I had met with both of them and they were now becoming very concerned that a strike of the company uh, could put the company under. And so uh, they agreed with me that we would have the Lazar for a people to look at the books if I would include an, a, a group of people who Mr. Bryan had been using, uh, which was ABREC, uh, and for the moment I can't think of the other gentleman's name, but it was two firms we put together to look at the company's books quickly and to make some recommendations as to how, uh, what the finances were. Uh, and. Uh, in the meantime, I was able to meet with Mr. Bright and others, and we drew up a letter of understanding between the three organizations that uh, the three organizations would meet together, and we would sit down and discuss if it was proven that the, uh, that the finances were such that the company needed relief, that we would sit down together and, and work out whatever was necessary to be done to ensure the financial health and security of Eastern Airlines. There is a letter in the files that uh, spells that out clearly. We, we, we worked on uh, then for, for some period of time as that being the foundation of what we was trying to do was to secure the, the health, uh, uh, the financial health of the airline. By achieving that, I convinced the management that we that they should make a proposal to the flight attendants that in essence would make the flight attendants whole in that bargaining, which really gave the flight attendants money, but then taking it back away in the 18 percent. I believe if, uh, and the facts would be there that the flight attendants maybe might have gained just a little bit, even though they, uh, the 18 percent was, was uh, went into a program. Uh, those negotiations were settled with the flight attendants tentatively. Then we entered into what was the, the, uh, the negotiations to uh, 
how we could ensure the financial health of the company. The flight attendants went ahead and ratified their agreement. Uh, there was quite a bit of acrimony around the flight attendants at that time, but it got worked out. The, the head of the flight attendants at that time was a lady named Pat Patricia Fink, uh, who was, uh, she had a very difficult problem of arriving at decisions, but uh, nevertheless we finally got there and an agreement was reached. Agreement was reached uh, uh, with the help of uh, Harry Bickford of the National Mediation Service of the National Mediation Board, <coughs> who had had experience in, in, in flight attendance negotiation. In fact, he came from the flight attendants himself years ago and had been a flight attendant at Eastern Airlines, so he understood the flight attendants uh, and, and their problems. Uh, after Lazar Ferre, uh, before they finalized the report, their preliminary report, we began to have, uh, I set up a series of meetings. We set up a meeting in the auditorium at Eastern Airlines, and it was kind of unique in the sense that we had uh, uh, the tables arranged in such a way that uh, at one table would be the IM, and another table would be the, the flight attendants, another table would be the, uh, the, uh, the pilots, and another table would be the management negotiating committee, and another table would be the advisors and uh, I, it was a podium that uh, I was kind of st uh, studying at that we was kind of chairing uh, these, uh, these uh, meetings. The meetings uh, went on for uh, several meetings. Uh, there was considerable acrimony, uh, obviously, as to what needed to be, how much, what caused it, all the other reasons, uh, a lot of negotiations uh, over, uh, over uh, several uh, uh, days and uh, weeks there, and finally uh, we arrived at uh, uh, at uh, an 18 percent reduction, uh, and supposedly a pledge for full cooperation between all parties. Uh, the the meetings uh, we had in different places uh, collectively. It finally boiled down that the most difficult one was going to be to achieve this, seemingly was the, going to be the International Association of Machinists. We uh, was finally got to uh, Mr. John Peter Paul, uh, who is a vice president of the International Association of Machinists, down to Miami uh, in a last stand meeting to try to work out something with the machinists, which would lead to, uh, uh, we thought, with an understanding with the other unions. Uh, Mr. Peter Paul brought with him uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Brian Freeman. Mr. Brian Freeman was had been a, a a new entrant into the discussions. Mr. Brian Freeman was formerly a, a an employee of the U.S. government at the Treasury Department. Had been involved in uh, and the uh, and to some degree the the help putting together of the Lockheed loan early that the government worked on and then. Uh, uh, subsequent to the Chrysler loan guarantee he had been involved in. And he'd also signed on to do some work with the unions in Conrail and the sale of uh, the railroad. And so Mr. Peter Paul knew him through that point and he became an advisor to, uh, to uh, Mr. Peter Paul. Mr. Bryant also had an advisor, uh, the, uh, uh, Mr. Abrick uh, and uh, Mr. Randy Barber. Uh, and so we had uh, 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 numerous advisors to the to to the various parties. Uh, one evening we had seemingly getting no place, and I suggested to uh, to the company that I go over to the uh, District 100's office, Mr. Bryan's office, and meet with Mr. Bryan and Mr. Peter Paul. And I suggested that I carry with me uh, Mr. Fred Bradley, who is a vice president of uh, Citibank and had, who had been the lead banker at Easton for many years. And Mr. Bradley was highly respected in New Easton over a long period of time. Uh, and I figured that he would be a credible person in talking with the unions. I also uh, suggested that Ray Manila, who was a uh, one of the uh, group from Merrill Lynch, who was the investment bankers, 
uh, to Eastern Airlines, uh, that he would also be credible uh, since Mr. Bryan uh, knew both uh, uh, Mr. Bradley uh, and Mr. Uh, uh, Manila and who they were. So we went over to uh, Mr. Bryant's office. We went over primarily to see if we couldn't just talk to them about the, the, uh, the uh, difficulties of the carrier and why uh, relief was needed uh, and, and why the uh, banks to, to, to go ahead with the covenants was going to need uh, uh, relief. Uh, we started talking, and in the meetings at the Union Conference Room was uh, was myself and Mr. Bradley and uh, Mr. Manila, uh, Mr. Bryant, Mr. Peter Paul, Mr. Barber, Mr. Brian Freeman, part of the time or most of the time. Uh, uh, and uh, as I recall, there were in and out a couple other people from the Union. The meeting, as I recall, was going to start around four was met at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We went on into the evening, and as we discussed more and more, we went on in to got close to midnight. And uh, as you will note, there wasn't any real official from Eastern Airlines in the meetings. I was on the phone numerous times with Colonel Borman. Uh, and uh, I got to... Uh, 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 kept him appraised of what was going on. Along about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, it was evident that we was going to be able to reach an understanding with the IM. So I called up Colonel Borman and asked Colonel Borman and Mr. Jack Johnson, who by this time had become the Vice President for Human Resource, and we should go back and talk about uh, Mr. Johnson and his arrival at uh, at Easton because he had been there a very short period of time at this time. Uh, in the so uh, after a lot of caucusing and Mr. Bryant and I meeting out in the in what was a courtyard of his office along with Mr. Peter Paul and a lot of uh, uh, a very difficult uh, uh, and hard talk and discussions, we finally arrived at an understanding of what was to be the 18 percent uh, and that uh, we was delighted arriving at that. Then the issue came up over the snapback uh, at the end of the, the following year. This was quite disturbing because no one had believed that the, that the company would be able to overcome its financial problems in, in a year. Uh, we reached what we thought was a firm commitment and understanding that the letter that we had said, talked about earlier that would ensure the financial health and security of the airline, uh, it meant just that. And we, re and we referred to it several times that at the end of the next year, that if the company still needed the money, we would sit down in good faith, as we had talked about then, and that we would renew that. Uh, as we will hear later, that became impossible to do. Uh, but after that understanding that night, uh, we went back and met with, had joint meetings with uh, the other two organizations and the company, and we put together uh, the final uh, agreement that uh, was the 18 percent to uh, program to save the company at that time. Uh, in this uh, uh, in this whole package, uh, at the request of a recommendation of Lazar, Ferre, and others, uh, the the concessions, as I recall, amounted to uh, I think it was 360 something million dollars. Uh, it was less than the report had said that the carrier needed, uh, but uh, the carrier was willing to accept that primarily based on the, on the good faith that we were really working towards saving the airline together and that that's what we needed to, to do. In return for that, the, the Lazar Ferre people had recommended that uh, the employees uh, be granted uh, 
a, an equity in the company, and uh, in return for that money, uh, the employees was, was granted uh, approximately one-fourth equity uh, based on not just the, uh, the $360 million, but the commitment to, uh, to ensure the financial health of the company. And since it was uh, the thought that the employees would have one-fourth of the company, that would be a more a desire and interest in the success of the company. Uh, and also, they would be part owners in the company to the point that they would really be investing in their own company, not only just their jobs, but their own company. Uh, it was also agreed that, uh, that uh, the m major institutions, namely the <coughs> IM uh, and the f flight attendants and the pilots, would have representatives on the board of directors. Uh, it was also agreed that uh, we would continue an employee involvement program that the employees would get employees more involved. That we would work together to improve productivity. That we'd have monthly meetings to, uh, to uh, discuss the finances of the company and that the unions would be given a briefing of the financial status of the, of the company prior to each of the board meetings at the, uh, when the board of directors would met. It also was agreed that, they, that the unions would, uh, would uh, have an involvement and participation in uh, the business plan for the company, and, 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 and uh, et cetera. So it was really thought and believed that uh, steps had been taken to fully ensure uh, that everyone would be a part of an endeavor to make the airline uh, a solid airline. Everyone recognized the difficulties that the airline faced in a deregulated environment. Uh, and where there had been some acrimony before, uh, we were pretty well, in, and during the course of the meetings, we had been pretty well uh, gotten to the point that we had set that aside. And things looked very positive uh, as to the future, uh, not only of labor relations. Everyone was delighted about the outcome, including the possibility of a new era in labor management relations where people sit down together and worked out their problems uh, and participated in the outcome of that point. Um, what time of year was it then? Was it already fall? This was, this was under the fall. This okay. was getting the close to, to uh, November because we had to have a business plan and a place for the following uh, year uh, in, 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 in January. Uh, and it had to have enough to achieve that business plan for the financial institutions to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, go along with the covenants and to uh, keep the loans in place and not recall the loans. Um, and uh, they, uh, the, the following months, uh, following that, uh, uh, there was quite a bit of an excitement about uh, what we were trying to do. Uh, uh, the the um, endeavor was ratified by the, the uh, various unions and uh, uh, the uh, IM and, uh, and as other unions and uh, they had promised productivity improvements and to do some other things to help reduce cost and some other things. So, uh, the IM, uh, I think, in pretty much in good faith, went out and set out to do that, uh, uh, where the uh, cost savings were not tremendous in the amounts of summer monies. Uh, the main thing was the support and the, the efforts to try to, to improve the airline. Unfortunately, with the flight attendants, the flight attendants had promised 5% improve in productivity, which would give us more flying time. We were never really able to achieve that 5% productivity, and that hurt enormously because it meant that you had to begin to hire, you had to hire more people as you sought to expand uh, the operation of the airline. Uh, the pilots contended that they had already made their productivity contributions and others earlier, which in fairness to the pilots, they had had, uh, they had made uh, con uh, several concessions, uh, but this was prior to the 83 thing. Uh, and uh, 
that began to uh, not set well with each of the groups. Uh, the mechanics thought the pilot should uh, should uh, put, put in more productivity as, as, as they had. Uh, the pilot said that they'd already given their productivity before the 83 thing and that the mechanics uh, is what brought, helped bring the dilemma about. Uh, the, the flight attendants immediately went into an election campaign in the union. Uh, 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 Pat Fink got defeated and uh, Mr. Callahan, uh, the president, came on board. Mr. Callahan took the position, I didn't make the commitments for the productivity gains, so, and I don't know anything about it, so it, we, we never got the productivity gains. And that started at least uh, some acrimony between the unions. But basically, uh, through the year of 84, uh, uh, things seemingly was looking up for the carrier, where we were not making money, we were, we were, we were breaking uh, even and doing relatively well because everyone had knew 84 was going to be a very difficult year anyway in the industry. Uh, then comes uh, uh, the, the fall of uh, 84 when again uh, they had to, uh, to, to uh, we would be, the carrier would be in default again in December the 31st if it didn't have a business plan that the banks could approve that would show that it could be at least profitable, or at least break even or profitable. Uh, uh, and so at the, at, the, at the end of 84, in November of 84, we were looking toward the calendar year of 85. Uh, we started in October earlier uh, asking the unions that let's sit down, the carry did, let's sit down and talk it through because we're going to have to continue the 18% in place. Uh, and, uh, uh, but with the 18% in place, uh, we can operate, we think, successfully. Uh, they had drew up a business plan that, was, that would call for a 2% profit. Uh, and that uh, anything over 2% would go into a profit sharing fund for employees. Uh, but the unions refused to let the 18% stay into place. The pilot's contract was going to expire in, uh, in, in April. Uh, the uh, flight attendant's contract was going to expire also at the, at the end of that period of time. In uh, 84, uh, uh, I'm not sure I got the sequence straight as I'm saying. Uh, the, the uh, mechanics contract was uh, already expired at that time. Uh, Mr. Bright took a position that the 18 percent was an automatic step back of December the 31st. Mm -hmm. And when he took that, the other unions was taking the same position. So doing, uh, uh, all during the month of November and December, we tried to achieve agreements to keep the 18% in place. Again, there became tremendous acrimony and acquisitions, which uh, 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 was injurious to, uh, to, uh, to the airline because of an airline being uh, 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 so many people uh, watch it and observe it, and they cause uh, flying it, and people think there's going to be a strike or acrimony again. It plays havoc with the uh, with the uh, with uh, uh, your revenue, pilots had a new negotiating committee, and uh, they had a new MEC chairman. MEC chairman, an entirely new uh, pilots committee than they had before. Uh, and I should say that uh, even with the 18 percent earlier that year, 
while the pilots finally did <coughs> ratify it, it went through several meetings before they finally did ratify it mm -hmm. because uh, they were still aggravated over supposedly Charlie Bryant demanding money that he couldn't achieve, the carrier couldn't afford in 83, and therefore that was what caused the problem. The new pilots negotiating committee chaired by uh, a guy by the name of Bob Brophy. Brophy had at one time been in management. He was a captain uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, it took some time that Brophy and I finally worked out an understanding of friendship with each other, but Brophy uh, uh, convinced me that there was no way that the pilots was going to enter into any other understanding until they had an opportunity to renegotiate the agreement which was going to be the following spring. Uh, there was no way we could get to the following spring because the carrier had to have a business plan that the banks would approve before December the 31st. Uh, so, uh, and Mr. Bryant said that there was going to be a snapback of the 18% that the carrier could afford it and the carrier was going to put it in place. The carrier said they couldn't afford it, and of course, uh, as I say, when Mr. Bryant took that position, the, the, the flight attendants took the position, and of course the pilot says if it's going to be put back, obviously for them, it goes back for us too. <coughs> the, uh, the, uh, the company carrier, namely Mr. Yeoman uh, and uh, Mr. Andresian, who is a financial officer of the company, Mr. Yeoman being the senior financial officer, had been meeting with the bankers, and we finally got a, a, a an extension from December the 31st to give us time to get contracts in a place that would call for a business plan. Uh, and so we, uh, at, with the extension of the 90 days, we went to work to try to do that uh, on. Uh, uh, last week in December or thereabouts, uh, Colonel Borman wrote a letter to all employees stating that he could not put the 18% back and that he was withholding it based on the commitment to the financial health of the company. This infuriated uh, uh, Mr. Bryant especially, uh, obviously made other employees uh, unhappy that it was seemingly arbitrary it got very bad publicity. Had uh, pictured Colonel Borman as a person who was uh, who was not keeping his word and was dominating the uh, something that should be uh, a part of collective bargaining relationship. So we went into January with the extension in a uh, from the banks and a very. Uh, uh, difficult environment. Finally, about the third week in the January, uh, and again we would have to get the dates, after several meetings that I had with Mr. Bright and others, I agreed to recommend to the company that they put the 18 percent back in for the month of January and then that would so-called so right the, the wrong that had been done by, uh, by Bowman by unilaterally keeping it out. <coughs> and then we would sit and talk about how we could proceed from that. So we did, rec we did put it in for the month of January, which cost the company $22 million just for the 18% for the month of January, the company management bought my recommendation to do that. Then I tied my recommendations to the to the three unions that uh, that what we do to uh, to achieve a business plan, and I recommended a settlement terms for them. And uh, after a lot of uh, very heated meetings, uh, primarily at the Hilton Hotel and others, both separately and jointly. We had one, and I mean separately and jointly, between the individual unions and the three unions. 
Uh, finally, the unions bought pretty much my recommendation for the basis of, uh, of, of achieving an understanding, uh, even though we would still later in the year have to negotiate a full agreement with all of the three unions at this time. And based on what we would do for that year, it was acceptable enough to the banks that we had a business plan approved. And so we entered into, into these understandings. Uh, and we went into negotiations with the, with the IM. Uh, the recommendations that I made, uh, of course, are available in the dates on them at the times that we did that. The, 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 in the meantime, we said we had to, we would enter into an interim agreement with the pilots, interim meaning until we could negotiate with them in April. Uh, and uh, uh, so um, we, we, for the moment, we had things resolved and we were entered into an interim agreement. The interim agreement got turned down by the pilots. It was renegotiated and it got turned down again. And uh, uh, it was a uh, a very trying period for the three months of the first three months of '85. Uh, in fact, to uh, uh, Mr. Gibson and others who were more directly in the pilots' negotiations can fill in a lot more of the details than I could. I didn't sit in all of the meetings with the various unions. Uh, the agreement that was entered into with the flight attendants was put out for ratification and it was turned down. Uh, and since the interim agreement also got turned down by the pilots, but nevertheless the banks had already given us the covenant relief for the year, but the, the people who had assisted us, uh, namely Mr. Bradley and others, were now, like some of the rest of us, embarrassed that, that we had covenants in place but did not still not have agreements in place. And it was based on the, uh, the uh, reaching and agreements with them. Uh, I had convinced that myself and subsequently convinced uh, Colonel Borman that uh, they, he had to restructure the airline in such a way that uh, because he had been in the, in the center and the focal point of so much of the controversy that we needed to, instead of him being a uh, president and chief executive officer as well as chairman of the board that he should reorganize and make a president of the company and that uh, bring in some different people and certain things that uh, faith and confidence could be restored in many areas with the with the unions. Great damage had been done to uh, to this. It was embarrassing for all of us, I, and I'd like to think to the unions too, because a lot of fanfare had been made earlier about in the, the year before about this novel approach and all the other things. Well, after se several weeks, uh, Colonel Bowman did, uh, uh, after studying a, a lot of different plans and discussing with his chief advisors to some degree, and namely with me, he. Uh, announced a reorganization plan, and uh, there was uh, Dr. Bart Ehrlich, who was a senior vice president at Easton, who had emerged as a candidate of the person most likely to become uh, uh, president of the airline. Uh, Dr. Ehrlich was a, uh, was a very uh, very much intellectually, and as understand, uh, and as I watched him, very bright. Uh, at the same time, I did not see him with the uh, with the uh, the leadership that was needed to be as president of the airline. But nevertheless, uh, Colonel Borman thought he was the best person. He, in his confidence, talked to uh, to uh, Mr. Ehrlich about this. Well, Sterlick, in the meantime, had spent a lot of time lobbying the board of directors at Easton because uh, there was a there was great ambition on his part to be president of the airline, and he was competing with another senior vice president, Mr. Russ Ray, 
uh, who was a senior vice president for marketing. Um, uh, on the, there was to be a pilot's union meeting in Emmy. Okay, we're back on. Uh, just repeat just a little bit of that. Uh, uh, that was the pilots had arranged to have one of their NBC meetings and one of their union meetings called the NBC meeting in New Orleans. Well, Mr. Larry Schulte was chairman of, as, as, as I said earlier, he was chairman of the NBC. Uh, Mr. Schulte by the name of the had been to come on and as militant and as strong as, as uh, as uh, Mr. Blunt, in fact, it was a period that he was determined to be as militant as strong as that Mr. Blunt was. Mr. Blunt was the, the focal point of the really one's attention, basically. You were just saying that Schulte was becoming Schulte a... become very militant. Each man was very strong and was trying to even become stronger than Blunt. Colonel Borman I had a genuine desire. I had a strong feeling for the pilots, uh, and uh, it hurt him greatly uh, that the pilots had become, uh, had seemingly become mad with him. And this all started over the 83 thing when they thought he took their money and gave it to Brock. Mm -hmm. All during the years that Colonel Walman had been in the Eastern, he had had a very close working relationship with the pilots. They respected him and he respected them. Colonel Walman was a pilot himself, obviously, and a test pilot. Uh, he, knew, he knew as much about airplanes as any of the rest of them, and talked their language and so forth. So he was hurt at the, at the thought that. Uh, they didn't respect him as they had in the past. He was desirous to overcome that for two things, not only for his own personal, but more for Eastern Airlines. And so he called Dr. Ehrlich in, and Dr. Ehrlich was going over to New Orleans to speak at the union meeting. Uh, and, uh, and knowing that Dr. Ehrlich now had, had uh, a very uh, good working relationship with the pilots. And, uh, and uh, his working relationship, I have, was convinced, was developed uh, primarily because of, uh, of uh, his desire to get along with the pilots. It wasn't based on any decision making or anything else. He was uh, saying to a large degree what the pilots wanted to hear, and he became mm -hmm. their friend as a result of that. Uh, but Colonel Bowman had a pretty faith and confidence in, him, uh, in Dr. Early, so he called him in just before the, he was going over to New Orleans. And told him that he had uh, he had uh, reached a decision and selected him to become president of the airline. Uh, that was told to Dr. Ehrlich in confidence. Uh, recognized that he probably was going to tell his friends and the pilots. So he goes over to New Orleans and apparently tells his friends and the pilots that he's going to become president of the airline and how he's going to change all those things and do the other things. On uh, the following week, I believe, or shortly thereafter, uh, there was to be board meetings and other things, and the changes announced uh, who was going to take the new positions and so forth. Um, in the meantime, uh, there was uh, Russ Ray, uh, who was the Vice President of Marketing, and Dr. Ehrlich, had the key positions to get on, but I think that almost everyone would say, that, uh, that a working relationship was very superficial, that uh, they were jealous of each other, that they did not keep each other advised uh, in, in the way that they should. Uh, and so when Mr. Lurie uh, understood that Dr. Ehrlich may become president, he became very upset, as well as many other people in the airline when it became obvious that Ehrlich may become president because Ehrlich was not trusted by hmm. a lot of people. Now, for whatever it's worth, I had supported Mormon that that was his selection, that was what he wanted, and that was the city that he had to think over properly because that would be the successor to him, and if that's what he wanted, that's what he should do. By the time the board meeting came, 
all of that was also was going to uh, bring in, uh, uh, give a new position to uh, Mr. Joe Lennon. Joe Lennon was now head of the maintenance operation, and Joe Lennon had, was a new uh, person to the airline, had a new in the sense of going to about, about a year or that about, had came from Northwest Airlines, and originally worked for, uh, for American Airlines, but was highly respected in the maintenance operation. And, uh, uh, he had a bit of, uh, pretty quickly had made a name for himself, and he was being considered uh, in, this, uh, in this case the number three man that would be born one and then Dr. Rolick and uh, Bill Lennon. And about some time for the board meeting, and before that, and, you know, Colonel Borman had been talking to a number of people. He reversed his decision on Ehrlich because Ehrlich was going to create controversy at the board and among his whole senior staff. And so he reversed his decision and decided not to make more Ehrlich president. And so this not only infuriated more Ehrlich, but it infuriated the pilots who, uh, who, uh, who uh, felt that uh, they had been done in again by Bournemouth because of his relationship with Ehrlich. And that the office of was uh, created a president with his left level in the meantime, they moved. Uh, Leonard now was what I had been the third man, he moved in kind of a second position, but not as president. Uh, for, uh, I uh, forget this title of executive vice president for flight operations and some other things. It was, I think it was uh, uh, an director and uh, uh, I can't remember exactly the title, but it was several to an airline director and other. And I'm going to, I'm going to, it was obvious that Dr. Ehrlich was going to be let go, so the plan could be worked out, but uh, that he could gracefully leave, uh, uh, work it out somehow. And uh, shortly thereafter, in uh, three or four weeks, two or three weeks, Dr. Ehrlich was, was let go. He was uh, given another follow up. He was negotiated a, a uh, the uh, servants package with him and some other things. And what it was really ironic that Russ Ray, the guy that was sort of so adamant, or one of the people so adamant against Dr. Ehrlich became the president, uh, it was coincidental that on the same day that Ehrlich left, Russ Ray left, Russ became president, uh, had gotten an offer to be president of Pacific Southwest Airlines. And so it was ironic that they both well, were legal almost on the same body that had been so competitive to the uh, president of the airline. Uh, this is Dr. Ehrlich's departure. He had been very bitter. He had met with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, another of the people, the Wall Street Journal reporter, that came to me about uh, And I would not, what I knew, I could not confirm or deny it was I was privy to a lot of information about it. But uh, 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 it was very confidential, but I had known him and I didn't advise any Colonel Borman. Meantime, uh, I guess it had been both perceived, and I guess in reality I had become a uh, number one advisor to Borman in a lot of areas, and most of the areas. He seemingly relied on me greatly. Uh, and, uh, Dr. Ehrlich, since I was, he had reasons to probably know or believe that uh, where I respected him and respected his knowledge, that uh, I was uh, not in enamored with him to which a degree. So uh, apparently he said to others that I was, I was in part, if not in most, responsible for him not being president of the airline. Uh, nothing was further from the truth. In fact, uh, I supported Dr. Ehrlich to the end only because of the chaos and the problems it was going to create 
where he would have not been my first choice to start with was that Bowman said he was the man. I supported that. He apparently said that to the pilot, and I got a very nasty two uh, line letter from Schulte, a copy of the letter that went to Bowman that I had outused, outlived by uselessness on an Eastern Airline property, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et I was not uh, wanted on, uh, on uh, uh, airline pilot's property uh, and any way to involve myself with airlines. The weather is around someplace and this is very shortly. Uh, I, I could, for first, I couldn't figure out why he, Schulte, would do that, realizing it could not have been anything with my labor in his body. And as a few days went by, it became evident that uh, he had thought that I had been his friend in, or their friend in, uh, Lord Ehrlich, which I said, is, which was not true at all. Uh, but, so therefore, for several months, I did not, I, I chose not to answer, uh, Schulte's letter. Bowman, for whatever reason, did not answer it because Bowman was trying to get along with the pilots. Uh, Bowman, uh, well, I guess he still had faith and confidence in me and the other organizations that had been suggested that I not have any things to do with the pilots and the pilots' negotiations. So several months went by that I said a lot of negotiations went on with the pilots that I was not directly involved in, I was not directly, not directly participating in. Uh, a uh, very sad, difficult thing happened to the airline. First of all, the airline was lucky in one a non-stop for, route from Miami to London, so I had been seeking for years. Terry immediately went out and was able to luckily obtain two DC 10s. Uh, and then uh, to fly the route non stop, they get the planes and get, spend a lot of money and advertising in London. Lo and behold, the DC 10 was about the only piece of equipment that uh, the, the work rules. And pay grades had not been worked out, and it was not worked out in the union contract, so they had to enter into negotiations uh, with the pilots over the pay, pay rates for the DCTM flight. In the meantime, the interim agreement had been voted down because it was uh, based on uh, if any of the other unions turned down the agreement, this agreement was supposedly you know, dropped dead, as they said or others. The mechanics turned the agreement down the first time, and then they subsequently ratified it, though. Uh, the carrier took that it was a ratified agreement. The supply attendants uh, uh, turned theirs down. Uh, the carrier took the position that the, flight of, that the pilot's agreement, interim agreement, was in, in effect. The pilots took the uh, position that were not in effect, so they go to some, they go to file a, uh, a court suit. <coughs> they filed it in New York State to get some judge who had ruled on the Pan American case earlier. And uh, so all during the summer of 85, exactly, uh, they in court. And, uh, and, of course, Bowman and Gibson, who is the chief negotiator for the carrier, was trying to resolve it. They couldn't find ways to resolve it. Uh, and uh, as, a <coughs> as a result of uh, not being able to resolve the lawsuit, even if the carrier gave the pilots 100% of what they wanted to DC-10, including uh, the 18 percent that, that was being withheld, uh, and give, given the pilots all they wanted to fly the London run, the pilots held that agreement uh, in hostage and said they would, even though they were given all they wanted, they would not re enter into that agreement, so uh, the interim agreement problem was satisfied. So to satisfy the <coughs> that and to get out of court, 
a new agreement was reached with the pilots, which was probably the most ridiculous collective bargaining agreement or that uh, or understandings that I can remember in, uh, in, uh, in all of my experiences. They entered into an agreement with the pilots on an interim agreement, which really now that didn't even make any sense for an interim agreement because what you really needed was a new collective bargaining agreement because the interim agreement was only supposed to get you from from the fall of, of, of 84 to the spring of 85 and now we're already in the summer of 85. So it was really negotiating a new agreement. But now the whole thing had got over principle and uh, the pilots was going to prove that they was tired of being what they thought uh, so, uh, made second class when they were really wanting to do it. right. Finally, an interim agreement was entered into with the understanding we will negotiate a new agreement, but in the meantime, we will give you wage increases the same as the IM is going to get under their agreement if we haven't reached an agreement by those dates. That dates went on for well during the period. Now, here's the carrier had an agreement in place that's already given them wage increases that they couldn't afford and even didn't have an agreement yet. So, uh, as I say, I was not in any of that decision-making process, primarily based on uh, Schulte's letter to me earlier uh, and uh, to Bowman with a copy of me so he can stay up on uh, their property. As it rolled on, and it was obvious that we was headed for another crisis, uh, I had met several times with the National Alpha people. I called up uh, Schulte, and I went and had lunch with Schulte and Carl Gables. And we talked about the Mort Ehrlich thing, and uh, in essence, uh, he was willing to let bygones be bygones. So I got back involved then to about four months later to try to see if we could make some sense out of how we was going to achieve uh, uh, a new agreement and agreements this fall. And by this time, uh, the, the carrier had decided <coughs> to ask for mediation. Uh, pilots had never been in mediation in Easton, and uh, they were very frightened about, you know, very concerned about uh, mediation because they knew mediation might eventually get them on the 30-day clock, and they was as concerned about getting on the 30-day clock as they were almost about a strike uh, because of the so-called continental uh, episode that happened before. Um, it became evident in October and November that the that the the carrier was going to be in in, in extreme um, uh, difficulty and most likely would be bankrupt if we didn't do something. We uh, appealed the carrier did to the National Mediation Board to have been no real meetings during the summer months with the flight attendants. Uh, the Transport Workers Union parent organization had, hadn't been involved to amount to anything. The contract had been turned down by the flight attendants. Uh, the, the, uh, the executive committee of the flight attendants uh, went against uh, Callahan, who was president, and after it was turned down, Callahan tried to rejoin with them. So there was no real leadership and no clear direction as to, as to all during the summer. So we thought the best thing to do is to get into mediation and as soon as possible get on the clock to see if getting on the clock in the 30 days wouldn't force the hands of the Transport Workers Union and the union to come with grips at the meeting of leadership. There seemed to be no incentive with the, tran with the flight attendants to make any agreement. Even though they were working for 18% less, they had all by this time filed a lawsuit themselves and because the union was uh, so the, the propaganda was that we're going to get our money back anyway, so it doesn't make any difference. So they didn't, they didn't have to make any agreement, and uh, and they just went all through the summer that way, um, which is the difficulty of the Railway Labor Act that we probably need to talk about as that is applied to Eastern and other times. Uh, 
Finally, uh, a mediator was assigned, or he had been assigned for a long time, for months. Finally, it was convinced <coughs> that it had to come to an end, and the, and the, the mediation board was convinced that the 30-day cooling off period should start, because by this time, the banks had said they would give the company to March the 1st, no longer, no if and buts about it. Bowman had been to New York, Gilman had been to New York, every place in the banks says no. We have been, we have, we have the, the, what the unions have said they do in the past, they have not lived up to it. The whole labor relations down there is out of control. Uh, and that uh, we're not going to give more money there to, uh, to give to, uh, the, uh, to the employees because the company carry cannot afford it. In the meantime, back during the uh, early summer, when, uh, when again, I was not that much involved at that time, a decision was arrived at that they would modify the IM agreement. And, uh, and, and by this time, the IM already has a ratified collective bargaining agreement that calls for, call for uh, productivity improvements, and that would be measured and the people would receive compensation uh, in the savings of the productivity increases. Well, uh, it was not shortly after this agreement was made that it became obvious that, uh, that this was just going to be a thorn in everybody's side, that the IEM, even if they could get improvements uh, uh, su sufficient to warrant that, everybody else was going to be irritated saying that the IEM is getting theirs back for for productivity they ought to be doing anyway. So the carrier was at this time probably had making more money uh, than it had ever made uh, probably at any time it had passed or it perceived it had. Uh, 85 started out where it was a very bad year for Easton. Shortly after it got into the first quarter it became one of the best years or start looked like it was going to be the best years they ever had primarily because of the windfall from the Pan American strike. Easton picked up all of that business. Then later, United strike. The yield was up, business was up, things were good. Come August, uh, Pan American's back in the air, United's back in the air, United started to uh, reduce fares and People's Express. Pan American trying to get business back. Everybody started to reduce fares, reduce left to more reduced, and catastrophic things came upon the airline. And, uh, and uh, starting in the in, in August and uh, on into the rest of the year. At one time, since they were setting aside the money for the profit sharing in '85 for the people, at one time I think it was nearly 130 million dollars that was set aside for profit sharing. It looked as if the employees was going to make out pretty damn good, even on the profit sharing side. Now the profit, even though the profit sharing was set aside, if the if the carrier had to use it, they could go back to use the money because the profit was going to be based on the yearly profit rather than any monthly. But it was set aside on a monthly basis. Starting in August, they started using out of the profit sharing, and it went from 135 million to to a zero, using up all the profit sharing from this point. Uh, <coughs> this brought accusations from Charlie Bryant that the company was intentionally underflying the business schedule, intentionally trying to lose money only to create a uh, controversy to get this, which is most ridiculous and sadly that he, <coughs> he would arrive at this. He made these accusations to the board of directors which was bad enough that a union official would say that, but uh, as a member of the board of directors, so, uh, it is a question as to whether he could not have been held liable for such a statement as a board of directors, but <coughs> nevertheless, he, no one wanted to pursue that. So uh, the, the flight attendants being on the cooling off period, uh, they, uh, and the cooling off period I think started on December the 15th, uh, you had to get both that cooling off period in and the, and the pilot's cooling off period in because you was going to have to have agreements before March the 1st or you wasn't going to be able to get the, uh, the, the, re the relief from the covenants, uh, relief from uh, the banks that you needed to extend the covenants and you find yourself in technical default. Uh, 
close to 30 day clock started running finally got uh, a little bit of negotiations going I was not directly involved a little bit of negotiations going this guy by the name of Roly Pizarro was chairman of that negotiating committee very little happened about 10 days before the cooling off period was in and the union to be free to strike uh, the union announced to the world that they were not going to strike that uh, and they called upon the company not to implement the work rules or anything. They would just work on the march the first till everybody else decided what everybody else was going to do. The company had no choice, or the carrier had no choice, but to implement the work rules on, uh, on the, uh, around the 15th of January, I believe it was, the 16th or something like that. In the meantime, the carrier had demanded for the mediation service mediation from the, for the pilots. And uh, I would have to say that the board moved quite hastily because the board, I think, became convinced from the bankers and others that they would be standing in the way after March the 1st if, if it was still, uh, hadn't been released because the carrier could not really exhort to self-help and therefore they would be responsible for it. So almost in a short span of time, it let, uh, Walter Wallace, chairman of the mediation board, let it be known that he was going to release the, the, uh, the case. Uh, on or about the 15th of January, we had some negotiations here in Washington, uh, whatever week it was, it was the Super Bowl weekend here. We started on Friday night, went all night, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday. We thought we was going to achieve agreement with the pilots. It was really some good faith bargaining. Uh, we broke off on a Sunday night because an agreement could not be achieved. We was put on the clock as of a Sunday night, and this, I think now this was put us up to somewhere around the 23rd or 24th before that cooling off period would run out. And that was getting very close to March, the first deadline of, uh, of uh, when the banks would, would be moving in for, to, we'd be in technical default. Uh, then uh, uh, not any negotiations was held much in the first two weeks of the cooling off period. Usually that's the way anyway because now that we end the cooling off period, uh, everybody will wait till the pressure builds again on this. Mm. Uh, the, even though the, uh, the flight attendants were flying under the implemented work rules, the sick leave was running 17, 18 percent and they was losing a lot of crews and a lot of other things. So the airline was operating very poorly because of that, which was very bad on the airline also for revenue. Uh, the whole concern had been that they, that uh, how was they going to get the IM to agree to something that they already contract in, in effect, uh, and uh, as we as we was going into the pilot negotiations, this was a big issue. So I think we might as well stop there and we'll pick it up. Uh, I want to talk to uh, Francois.